We know much more in terms of clinical trial evidence about the benefits of lowering LDL cholesterol than we know about the importance of triglyceride elevation, which clearly is important, but we don't have clinical trials that really have targeted triglyceride elevation. And as frustrating as it may be, we know that HDL elevation is a marker of risk. In other words, negative marker. The higher your HDL, untreated, the lower your risk for atherosclerotic coronary or cerebrovascular peripheral vascular disease. But we still have no evidence that altering the HDL with drug therapy improves outcome. So we're very, very LDL focused. And Although we're LDL focused, there continues to be controversy about how to best approach LDL elevation and how to best minimize atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So we'll talk about the guidelines, <clears throat> what's new, and um, try to give you a complete overview of what's going on in lipids. Here are my disclosures again. Here are the objectives uh, to recognize the four patient populations who benefit most from statin-based therapy according to the ACC AHIE 2014 guidelines. We'll talk about the controversy surrounding targeting LDL cholesterol as a treatment goal. We'll define the population where additional lipid-lowering agents with or without a background of statin-based therapy have further improved cardiovascular outcomes. And we'll define the role of the newest class of agents, uh, the first class of agents really that we've had since the bile absorption inhibitors, um, about uh, 10 years in the making, the PCSK9 inhibitors, which further lower LDL cholesterol. And we'll talk about where we stand with utilization uh, and where we stand with their outcomes. So just <clears throat> on a scale of one through five, if you will, um, one being not at all confident, five being very confident. How confident are you in the evaluation and management of people that come into your office with lipid abnormalities? Okay, here, hypercholesterolemia. So one, not at all confident, to five, very confident. And if you answer four or five, we can go on to the next talk. Give it one more second or two. We'll see if you improve at the end, but okay. So uh, you all feel pretty good about this. Okay, we'll continue on. So if you look at what's happened with death rates from cardiovascular disease, and this is the latest figures that one can find, you can see at the top in total cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, other cardiovascular disease or stroke, you can see that we're doing much better. The public is more engaged. The public is more informed. We are better informed um, to effectively um, lower the risk of cardiovascular disease overall. As you know, or may have heard just a couple of days ago, the most recent information suggests that there's a flattening of cardiovascular disease reduction and most uh, experts now feel that it is because um, of the obesity epidemic that's really contributing to metabolic syndrome, metabolic disease, diabetes, and the like, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and uh, one needs to be concerned about that. If you delve down a little bit more, just looking at cholesterol, you can see that from 1988-94 on the far left all the way to 2007-12, in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, 20-year follow-up, we are doing much better. Um, total cholesterol is down. And two days ago, they updated this information. Total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol are both down. HDL cholesterol is up. And most of the impact is from diet and exercise. I know it's hard for us to believe. Clearly, there's some impact of therapeutics with drugs, but um, the message is getting out to more individuals. So there is some success here. Now, let me, I'm going to make some just general epidemiologic observations that are extremely important for our clinical practice. 
And first, the title of this, the evidence for statin, these are the landmark trials. The first point, the greater the risk of our individual patient, the greater the benefit of statin-based therapy in lowering LDL. And the higher the LDL at baseline, the higher the risk. And the lower the LDL cholesterol, the greater the benefit of using statin-based therapy. So in the pink, with a very steep slope of the line, as opposed to blue, which is a more narrow um, steep of the, of the uh, pitch, one can see secondary prevention and primary prevention, respectively. So in the 4S trial with simvastatin, looking at placebo <clears throat> compared to active intervention of 20 to 40 milligrams of simvastatin, one can see the benefits the percent coronary heart disease event reduction and the reduction in LDL cholesterol. And notice that you get more return when you already have identified individuals with cerebrovascular, peripheral vascular, or atherosclerotic coronary vascular disease as opposed to those in your office waiting to see you who have no recognized cardiovascular disease in blue. So this is to an LDL of 90. This is taking it a little bit more recent, where you can see the LDL is now less than 70. Remember, we used to use that, or still do use that as a target. And you can see, once again, the placebo studies from the active intervention RX treatment studies. And this is a secondary prevention steep slope. And it just shows, once again, the benefits of lowering LDL with reducing coronary events. The lower the LDL, the fewer the, the events. Statin-based trials. The other point is that where we used to worry about lowering LDL cholesterol below a certain threshold, knowing that when we're first born, our LDL cholesterol is 25 milligram per deciliter, and as we mature and eat a westernized diet, et cetera, our LDLs go up higher than that, to where the LDL now mean is about um, just about 100. That's the mean LDL. You can see that here, the lower the LDL cholesterol, the greater the reduction in major coronary events and cardiovascular events. And now we're down to less than 50. And the most recent information is that there doesn't appear to be any danger in the floor for reduction of LDL cholesterol. Now, when you compare one strategy versus another of active therapy in patients with an acute coronary syndrome, patients we consider at greatest risk, the drug manufacturer of pravastatin at the time believed that it didn't matter what agent or which agent you use. So they were bold enough to compare their drug, pravastatin, to atorvastatin, 40 prava, 80 of atorva. Of note, in this double-blind randomized trial, using pravastatin at a moderate intensity and, and atorvastatin, which now we consider high intensity, the LDL collect reduction was much greater with atorvastatin, where the median was 62, and with pravastatin, it was 95 and the reduction was 21% from baseline with 40 milligrams of Prava, <clears throat> and just short of 50%, right? That's what we say for high intensity, at 49% with a Torva. And when they looked at the outcomes, the outcomes were significantly better with a Torvastatin compared to Pravastatin. So this was a negative trial for the makers of Pravastatin. And in addition, if you look at a sub-study right here, on achieved LDL, there is no concern for an LDL of less than 40 compared to the referent group of 80 to 100. In fact, the cardiovascular event reduction was 39% reduced at less than 40 to the referent group. So a couple of points, and that is that cardiovascular event rates are lower with high intensity compared to moderate intensity statin in a double-blind randomized trial. And there's no floor of concern for how low you lower LDL, at least here, to less than 40 milligram 
per deciliter. When you compare 10 milligrams of atorvastatin to 80 milligrams of atorvastatin in the treat to new targets in which all patients had coronary heart disease and an LDL less than 130 on entry, followed for a median of five years, good primary endpoint. Here you can see, as you would expect, the high intensity 80 of atorva in blue compared to the 10 of, of atorva in um, orange, further lowers LDL cholesterol, further lowers total, further lowers triglyceride, and has really no effect on HDL cholesterol. But when you look at the endpoint reduction, 80 of atorva significantly reduces the primary endpoint of major cardiovascular events more so than 10 milligrams of torva. So we know about high versus medium potency or intensity statin. Now we know in the same class of statin, further LDL reduction is beneficial and high intensity, that would be 80 of a torva, one of the two high intensities we have, is a more effective cardiovascular event rate reducer than 10 of a torva. So right away you can see no floor for LDL reduction. We are benefited by a high intensity statin compared to a moderate intensity statin in high risk individuals. Secondary endpoint reduction already with established cardiovascular disease. If you look at a meta analysis of all the trials that are done for any major coronary event, coronary revascularization, stroke, for every 39 milligram per deciliter, or as they say in Canada and England, millimole per liter LDL reduction, always to the left of the univariate line, you get a reduction in all these events. It doesn't matter the baseline of your LDL, although the higher, the greater your risk. For every millimole reduction, you get a reduction in these endpoints. So clearly reducing LDL cholesterol is extremely important most defined by the risk of the patient. If the patient is at low risk, hard for us to sometimes realize that, you're not going to get as much benefit as if the patient is at high risk. So all of these trials used fixed dose statin therapy. They did not up titrate in a double blind randomized manner. They used a particular dose of statin and then saw the results of the trial. There was no titration to goal. So where are we? Well, if you look at where we've evolved from, on the far left, 2010, excuse me, on the far left, right, was our old goal in 1988, ATP1, less than 130. We realized lower was better, ATP2, goal less than 100. We continued with that, but in 2004, we had a therapeutic optional goal of less than 70. Then we continue with that, and that is pretty much where we are now. It's all about defining risk, and the targets have been either less than 100 or less than 70, even though I've told you some important pearls about lower appearing to be better than higher. What's more interesting is the controversy that exists between different camps of expertise. On the left, the ACC AHA and the ADA both recommend a percent reduction from baseline. If you start at high risk, they want you to reduce your LDL 50% or more using statin-based therapy. On the other hand, on the far right, all of these groups, the National Lipid Association, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, the International Atherosclerosis Society, and the European Society of Cardiology, and Atherosclerosis Society recommend targets. We call them goals. A lot of people like the term targets. And the target in the highest risk individual has been less than 70. Now the National Lipid Association has come out with a guideline and they are critical of the American Heart Association ACC guideline because they still like targets. And the targets based on risk category from low to very high, either based on non-HDL cholesterol, 
which is a non-fasting, any time of the day, total minus HEL. So if your total is 150 and your HDL is 40, your non-HDL is 110. And the goal is 30 non-HDL above the LDL goal. So if your LDL goal is less than 70, your non-HDL goal is less than 100. If Mr. Jones comes in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, non-fasting, you can get a non-HDL. It's all the atherogenic lipoproteins that are circulating in the blood, including LDL, IDL, VLDL. So triglycerides are also impacted. Non-HDL, total minus HDL. And at the top are the non-HDL goals for each category, and at the bottom here are the LDL goals. And you can see they're separated by 30, and that's because triglyceride over 5, triglyceride normal being, quote, 150, that's 30. And that's how you get that relationship. How many of you are using non-HDL in your practice as opposed to LDL? By a show of hands. How many are using targets still and not just intensity? Yeah. A lot of folks still are using targets. So this pretty much goes along with what's been known in the past. The lowest goal is 70 L, less than 70 LDL or less than um, one, 100 LDL cholesterol. And that just separates <clears throat> two high risk and low, very high or low categories and how they define them. So, we had this update in 2013-2014, which was evidence-based, clinical trial-based, and which had a number of recommendations and a new perspective. A couple of important points they made. There's no randomized controlled trial evidence to support continued use of specific LDL cholesterol and or non-HDL cholesterol treatment targets. The appropriate intensity of statin should be used to reduce ASCVD risk in those most likely to benefit. The clinical trials compared a TORVA 80 to 10, but didn't double-blindly randomize one group to less than 70, one group to less than 100, and one group to less than 130 a priori. And then we might have learned if less than 70 was better than 130. Instead, and it may be fine for many in this room, we observed that less than 70 is better than less than 100. But we didn't randomize people to those targets. So a small little point, but because of that, ACCAHA came out with two drugs they recommended as high intensity, one of which is, uh, both of which are generic, one of which is a more effectively priced, and that would be atorvastatin, 40 to 80. The other is rosuvastatin, 20 to 40 and a number of drugs that are associated with 30 to 49 percent LDL reduction at the doses of those medications. So high intensity, moderate intensity, statin therapy, first line therapy for patients at risk with LDL excess to reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The four groups that they targeted included three, uh, two gr one group with known disease, secondary prevention at the top, and that included cerebrovascular stroke or TIA, cardiovascular, post-MI, post-bypass or uh, PCI, um, post-known atherosclerotic vascular, cardiovascular disease on angiogram, and for the first time, peripheral vascular disease, either an ab abnormal ABI of less than 0.9 or claudication. Those groups were all treated the same in terms of who needed statin-based therapy. Based on the clinical trials and age, if you were no more than 75 years of age, a high-intensity statin was recommended. And because older people have more difficulty in tolerating statin therapy and because no clinical trials repeatedly had the oldest of the old in the trials, they recommended a moderate intensity statin for older people, 76 and older. 
The three other categories are primary prevention. You look into that office and you just can't sink your teeth into any known vascular disease that these people have, even though they may be at risk. The first group were people with an LDL of 190 or greater. Now, what's important here is that this is not, in the words of Yogi Bear, the average bear. These are people that may have a familial form of hypercholesterolemia. The second group is the diabetic, between 40 and 75 years of age, whose LDL is less than 190. Otherwise, you would have thought of them in the familial group. And all diabetics are not created equal. They come with different risk. And so if you calculated by using the pooled equation, which I'll talk about in a minute, that their risk was 7.5% or greater over 10 years, a high-intensity statin was also recommended for these diabetics, but if the risk was 5 to 7.4 percent, a moderate-intensity statin was recommended. That's it, another group. And then the third group are folks 40 to 75 years of age who are not diabetic, have known no known atherosclerotic disease, and you calculate their risk, and their risk is 7.5 percent or greater, primary prevention, you consider a moderate or high intensity statin therapy. These are the four groups. So if someone's LDL was less than 70 or was less than 40 or, and, and did not have diabetes or known atherosclerotic vascular disease, there was no strong recommendation to go one way or the other. It was basically between the clinician and the patient to decide what would be best for that individual patient. The three main issues with statins, and I know you're aware of this, are non-adherence. They tell you they're taking them. They don't take them. Sometimes they don't fill them. More times they fill them initially, and then they don't fill them afterwards, or they fill them and they just don't take them. The second thing is that within the same patient population, there's inter-individual variability in their ability to reduce LDL for the same dose of statin. I'll show you that. And then the third issue is statin intolerance. If you look at adherence with statin therapy over two-year period, at six months, about half of them, by pharmacy records, EMR, half of them are not taking their statin. And many of us are not aware of it. And this is why I, al I always have my patients bring their bottles, their most recently filled bottle. I don't want to see a list, although I like everyone, and I hope you all carry a list in your wallet of anything you're taking. Gosh forbid, you know, you have to be taken to an emergency room. The other thing is maybe to carry a little baby aspirin in case you have to be heroic on the streets of New York in someone that has a sudden death. But I want to see the bottles, and I have an area on my desk where I want to see the bottles, I want to see the dates, and I want to see what they're filling. Everything. Solid, liquid, over-the-counter, non-over-the-counter, alternative, traditional. Whatever the rheumatologist is giving, whatever they're giving, I want to see it. I'm, as a primary care doc, I want to be able to coordinate all that and know what they're really taking. So this is a problem. These are good people that just don't understand the, the importance, if they're at risk, of taking the medicine. Even though statins are robust LDL-lowering drugs, there is significant, <coughs> significant interpatient variability in the response. Two studies. One is this study from atherosclerosis. These are patients uh, in clinical trials all on the same dose of the statin, all taking the statin, this atorvastatin-10, and it shows you the wide Inter-individual, inter-individual variability, both in men and women, at the same dose of statin with the LDL response. So those that have suggested that perhaps you don't even have to check the LDL after the patient's on it in four to 12 weeks or in three months, uh, you will not be able to detect if when they're taking it, they still may not have the response that you expected. So this can be an important point. And if you look at the clinical correlation of this in the Jupiter trial, looking at resubostatin, which was given as a fixed dose of 20 milligrams in the trial versus placebo, 
they found that 20 improved the outcomes. These were primary prevention folks, no underlying disease, um, in which they had to have a CRP of at least two or greater to get into the trial. And although the resubastatin, that's a high intensity dose, 20 milligrams, was expected to yield a 50% reduction in LDL, there was a wide variability in the LDL. And that variability correlated with event rate reduction. So when you look at the trial itself, you'll see that if the patients, and you can see um, the patients on placebo. Let me see if I can get this. OK. So these folks were on placebo, and you can see their event rate was 11.2. That The event reduction was 11.2. And of those that were on therapy, in pink, if they had no response, no reduction, or an increase in their LDL on 20 of resuvastatin, it was reduced a little more than placebo, 9.2 to 11.2 events per thousand in the, in the per thousand years in the study. But notice if they had less than a 50% reduction or the expected more than 50%, 50% or more reduction, there was a lower event rate. So it's very important to make sure patients take their medicine and that they're getting the LDL response that you're expecting. And that's why even in the ACC guideline, they do say if the clinician wants to check the LDL response in 4 to 12 weeks, that is fine. OK. The third issue is statin intolerance. And this is a big issue. From the patients that just come into the office when they're at risk, and they just tell you flat out, I'm not taking that medicine. I've heard about it. I've read about it. I know about it. The girls, when we play bridge, they talk about it. There's no way I'm doing it. To patients that try it, but for whatever reason, just can't seem to stay on it. We think that there's probably 5 to 10% of patients that are truly statin intolerant. It most commonly is described as a muscle pain, a muscle ache, a muscle weakness. Um, but they have normal CPKs, and they stop the medicine. Sometimes the intolerance is just a perception of them knowing they're on a statin. Other times they read the insert and, gosh, or they listen to the commercial. Aren't those commercials frightening? They talk very quickly. But boy, they disclaim everything that can be associated with that drug. And what wouldn't you get if you take these drugs? And certainly our patients know about this. So what do you do? So you started them, let's say, on a Torvastatin 10. And you didn't, know a, you didn't get a CPK at baseline because it's not recommended. We do not get CPKs. We do not get liver function tests when you start a statin. You, you can get the liver function tests, but you, you, you don't have to anymore. Because clinically, we know statins are very helpful for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and they usually don't cause much hepatitis or transaminitis. So unless there's a clinical indication for knowing the liver function test, we don't follow liver function tests anymore when they're on statins. And CPKs we only get when they have muscle complaints. And that's when we order the CPK. And many of our patients at baseline have one and a half to two times normal CPK when they first start the medicine. They're joggers, they exercise, whatever. Um, it can happen. So what do you do? Well, you can re-challenge them with a statin. Or if they are on a Torva, Lova, or Simba, ALS, you can move to a non-P453A4 metabolized drug, like in order uh, Prava, Resuva, Pativa, or flora, fl Fluvastatin. So I call that statin roulette. Now, you can go from Simva to a Torva if you're using a generic, well-priced statin. But for the most part, if they don't tolerate one of those others, you can either go to the other within the P453A4 class or go to one of the others. But I think you should try three statins before you exhaust yourself from that. The other thing you can do, and by doing that, by the way, each time you change about a 60% benefit, you're going to be able to get 60% um, to stay on the drug. If you now change from a daily to a non-daily, every other, every third, or every week, less LDL reduction as you further out the dose, dosing strategy, you'll get more people to stay on the statin. 
or um, you can use non-statin treatment. And you could use a bile absorption inhibitor like azetamibe, or you could use a bile acid resin. These are all LDL-lowering drugs that do have evidence, um, either predominantly without a statin, which is the patient you're talking. After you exhaust all of that, a different statin, up to three, statin roulette, <clears throat> Um, every other or every third or once a week statin, fine, or you're going to use non-statin, um, you know, then you're, you're faced with a patient, according to the FDA, that is stat statin intolerant. And this is a patient, for whatever reason, that just can't tolerate a statin. Now, many patients labeled as statin intolerant can be rechallenged with a statin. But there is a real subgroup, maybe 5 to 10 percent of patients who are truly statin intolerant. So let's talk about non-statin monotherapy and statin combination treatment. Before statins were approved in 1985, lovastatin being the first, we did have evidence here on the left with the bile acid resin cholestyramine and with the fibric acid derivative, gemfibrozole, given BID, which should never be used with a statin. Phenofibrate is the only fibric acid that can be used with a statin. But before we had statins, gemfibrozole was used. It was a trade name pro product. You guys probably remember it. I think it was called Lopid. And then it became generic. But with statin-based therapy, we weren't going to use gemfibrozole. But we do have evidence compared to placebo in high risk on the far right or low risk people, primary prevention with bile acid resins, they reduce cardiovascular coronary heart disease events. The problem is we don't have evidence of these drugs on top of a statin. Nicotinic acid as monotherapy, statin intolerant, can't take a statin. We do have evidence as primary and secondary prevention. But not only do we not have evidence as an additive drug, nicotinic or niacin, to statin, we have evidence of harm. And I'm going to show you in a minute, the FDA is saying cease and desist of using fibric, uh, uh, niacin with a statin in the same patient. But we do have evidence before the statin-based uh, therapy was approved of benefits in both primary prevention and post-MI using nicotinic acid, niacin. What they said in the guideline was that non-statin therapies, whether used alone or in addition to statins, do not provide acceptable ASCVD risk reduction benefits compared to their potential for adverse effects in the routine prevention of ASCVD. I actually disagree a little bit. I think you could use niacin or gemfibrozole as a solo agent in a patient that doesn't tolerate a statin. But they went a little bit outside that, and this is what they said. There's an update coming in a little bit. When you are able to tolerate a statin, we have two trials that show adding nicotinic acid, as surprised as we were, are not beneficial for outcome. Yes, they might raise HDL, and yes, they might lower triglyceride, but they do nothing for the patient except cause harm and more side effects. Phenofibrate with a statin, there is no evidence of benefit when you use phenofibrate with a statin, even though they may lower triglycerides and raise HDL. <clears throat> and then fish oil. We are very excited about fish oils, but they are approved for triglyceride reduction and to reduce the risk of pancreatitis. They do not have an indication for reducing ASCVD. <clears throat> and we have a trial looking at fish oil on top of statins that we're anxiously awaiting. But currently, no evidence of fish oils <clears throat> for reducing ASCVD or in addition to a statin. <clears throat> so we are very statin-centric. But if you can't tolerate a statin, take a statin, we do have other opportunities. So it's been a rough couple of years for statin combination therapy. And I know you sit in your office, you have them on a high-intensity statin, and you don't like their triglycerides, and you don't like their HDL, <clears throat> and you say to yourself, well, I'd like to alter those lipid components. I think I would do well. Well, the reality is, in clinical trials, we haven't been able to show that. And the CTEP inhibitors, three are dead now. 
These are cholesterol ester transfers, transfer protein um, agents, which rearrange the lipid subfractions. <clears throat> and basically, we have one still that's alive, OK? And that's a product uh, that we're still waiting on the outcomes, and that's going to come in 2017. So when you look at the drugs and their combination, both AIM High and Heart Protection um, Survive 2, you can see that adding niacin extended release <clears throat> to a statin did nothing compared to a placebo. I mean, there is a superimposition of those curves. <coughs> no benefit at all. When you look at the CTEP inhibitor, this was torcetrapib. There was no benefit. In fact, there were more events with torcetrapib, and torcetrapib have an, had an off-target effect of raising plasma aldosterone and being associated with increased vascular death. So it was never coming to market. When you look at another CTEP inhibitor, dalcetrapib, in the DAL outcomes trial, a death of this drug, no difference. There was no benefit. This was killed in the grave for futility. No worry, but no benefit. And boy, it lowered the hell out of LDL and raised HDL. It really raised HDL. These drugs raise HDL, lower LDL, about a third of what they do to HDL. And so here's what we've got from the FDA. Based on several large cardiovascular outcome trials, including AIM High, Accord, and HPS2 Thrive, the FDA decided that, quote, scientific evidence no longer supports the conclusion that a drug-induced reduction in triglyceride levels and or increase in HDL cholesterol levels in statin-treated patients results in a reduction in the risk of cardiovascular events. The S FDA has determined that the benefits of niacin extended release tablets and phenofibric acid delayed release capsules with co-administration with statins no longer outweigh the risks, and the approvals for this indication should be withdrawn, a document filed in the Federal Register today states. The same reasoning was cited for pulling its approval of Advocor and Simcor, which were simvastatin or lovastatin um, with extended release niacin. So, how many of you were aware of this? This is a concern because I hate to say this, but 1-800-LAWYER is waiting. Um, and, it's, and it's a difficult issue. But it's interesting that even with this, the, the uh, tri TRIGS and the HDL going in the direction we wanted them to go on top of statin-based therapy, these two classes of drugs were not associated with any benefit and there was harm. So we're not using those. On top of statin-based therapy, this trial is anxiously awaiting, awaited. It's four grams of fish oil compared to placebo on, stop, uh, on top of um, st statin in high-risk individuals. To, to answer the question, if a statin and a rich dose of fish oil is better than a statin alone? Very important question to all of us. And these are the patients we see on the far left, men and women 45 and older with established coronary heart disease or at high risk for coronary heart disease. So we really anxiously await this trial reduce it. So we're building, you know, themes here. So um, the only drug that the FDA, although they haven't given it the indication, azetamide, that we might have expected they would give it, um, there is consensus that using a bile absorption inhibitor as opposed to a resin that binds bile acids in the gut, this keeps them from being absorbed, azetamide on top of a statin does improve outcome. And that comes from the IMPROVE-IT trial, high-risk people with acute coronary syndrome, double-blindly randomized to simvastatin-40 or simvastatin-40 and azetamide. Now, this is an industry-sponsored trial by the makers of simvastatin azetamide. Of interest, the third arm of a torvastatin 80, which might have gotten the same LDL reduction as simva 40 with 10 of azetamide, was not compared. This is an industry-sponsored trial, and they just ain't going to do that. So all of us have the question, although we could use azetamide and simvastatin together, to get a, a better LDL reduction than Simba 40, what would a Torva 80 by itself do? 
because currently we believe it's all about LDL reduction and not necessarily about the mechanism of how you get LDL reduced. When you look at this trial, well done, you can see that the combination of the bioabsorption inhibitor and simvastatin together reduced LDL about 15 milligram per deciliter more than the simvastatin 40 alone. And from what I told you in the third slide on the talk, the more you lower LDL, the better it should be. And sure enough, over seven years, <coughs> there was a benefit to using the combination associated, observed, to be associated with more LDL reduction. So everything's fitting in line. <clears throat> the major issue here becomes cost. But this drug is going to become a generic drug this year. <clears throat> it won't be $4, but it is going to be reduced in price. So the theme is expanding. When you draw a linear regression analysis of all of these trials for the amount of LDL reduction on the x-axis and the cardiovascular event, redu event reduction on the y-axis, you'll see that the improve it trial for the amount of LDL, only 15 milligram per deciliter, that's about 0.4 millimole, and the reduction in endpoint kind of fits right on the line. So this is a believable trial, although the drug is not a big time lower of LDL cholesterol. So it reaffirmed, reaffirmed the LDL hypothesis. Lower was better. The patients did better. And there was no cancer, no myopathy. The two drugs together were very safe and effective as the same statin dose in the two drug combination. Well, after all this came out, the ACC 2014 guideline updated their guideline because they felt they were a little too focused on statins. So they came out and said the following. For LDL reduction in the red box, in addition to statins, we now feel comfortable telling you that azetamibe can be used with a statin, that a bile acid sequestrant can be used as an alternative with a statin, and that the PCSK9 inhibitors, very effective LDL-reducing drugs, which I'll share with you in a minute, can be used with a statin. However, we're awaiting the outcome trials. So all of us feel very comfortable with the bile absorption inhibitor, the bile acid resin. I don't know how many of us have even had an opportunity to have patients that we wrote for a PCSK9 inhibitor, but we're evolving. Now, mypomersin and lipidamide are drugs that are used in familial homozygote hypercholesterolemia. So if anyone's going to use them, it's the pediatricians or a family uh, or a primary care specialist that is seeing young children or children of adolescent age, because that's when they're identified. So they're not in our armamentarium. And I don't know, I've had patients on LDL apheresis Certainly before the PCSK9 inhibitors, that's been used. It's like dialysis, but it just gets rid of all the LDL every two weeks to every four weeks. And uh, insurance companies will pay for it if the LDL um, <clears throat> not on a statin is uh, 300 or greater or on a statin 200 or greater. And there are people out there um, that qualify. So that's LDL apheresis every two weeks, every month. And they specifically said niacin is not routinely recommended. So, azetamide's the first choice, bile acid sequestrants, PCSK9 inhibitors. And that's the narrative from the updated 2016 guideline. It's all about LDL reduction. Now, what about primary prevention? We're talking about pa predominantly patients with known vascular disease, cerebral, coronary, peripheral vascular disease. What about primary prevention? Well. A recent trial called HOPE-3 was done. This is a 2016 April publication um, in the New England Journal. So they took 12,705 patients at intermediate risk. That's how they defined it. And they either put them on candesartan hydrochlorothiazide or placebo. And in the other factorial part, 
they put them on rosuvastatin 10 or placebo. Bottom line was blood pressure reduction did not improve outcome because the patients weren't at high enough risk from their blood pressure elevation. But over a 5.6 year median follow up, there was a benefit to the statin. And 10 milligrams of rosuvastatin reduced the primary major adverse cardiovascular event or MACE endpoint. Highly statistically significant. And if you look at exactly what it did, you can see that everything went in the right way, the primary endpoint, the secondary endpoint, MI, revascularization, and stroke, all reduced significantly. Primary prevention, intermediate risk. And if you put these folks on the linear regression, x-axis LDL reduction, y-axis event rate reduction, it falls on the linear line, as you can see. Hope 3 falls very close to the line, as you can see right there. So everything looks good for primary prevention. So cutting to the chase, there have been two major primary prevention trials. And I am not in any way recommending a particular drug for primary prevention. But HOPE 3 used Resuva 10, Jupiter used Resuva 20. Yes, industry sponsored both of these trials, the maker of Resuva statin. The LDL reduction on the far right was about half with 10 as you got with 20. That was 26 versus 50 percent. And the vascular event rates were twice as much with 20 as you see with 10, okay? So everything's falling into patterns that we're all developing as we look at our patients with dyslipidemia. Now, let's be fair. Would a torvastatin 20 or 40 have done as well as Resuva 10 at currently a much less price, lower price? I don't see why not, but this is the evidence that we have. So, in the guideline, we've got our four major groups. We've got primary prevention. We are not ready to put statins in the waters of our city. Now, there are countries where statins are available over the counter. Our FDA is never, I hate to say never, but they have told us they're never going to do this because they believe folks like us need to evaluate every patient and follow them for the benefit and for the risk. And we're not going to have water fountains that say statin associated, okay? It still takes clinicians to determine risk in primary prevention. We do have a risk calculator. It's an app. It's on your, app, uh, your Droid, your iPhone. It's pretty easy to use. That's how you download it. It has nine different factors on the far left. It tells you your 10-year risk for atherosclerotic disease, and it compares you to someone that's ideal with no risk factors. And this gives you your 10-year risk. So if you're 7.5% or more, you might use a high-intensity statin. If you're 5 to 7.4%, you might use a moderate-intensity statin, and your patient is going to negotiate with you and work with you, and you'll document all that on the chart. I am not a big technology guy. The only technological tool I like is the coronary calcium score when you don't know if you should use a statin or not. Because in, if you're on the fence in a primary prevention patient, the coronary calcium score can tip you over to realizing risk and benefit. In this particular uh, trial from Eric, 6,700 men and female, male and female age 62. These are people with no cardiovascular disease, who have a coronary calcium, and this is their five-year risk of having an event. And it tells you their risk, um, their, their risk over five years. And if the patient has a normal coronary calcium score, you would not move to use a statin. But if they have a coronary calcium score anywhere above 100, you would consider, and if it's above 300, you would try to convince the patient. So this, I only do this test one time currently in a lifetime. 
And that's only when I haven't decided on using a statin. And I think it's evidence-based and very clinically based to use it in that way. So this just summarizes how to use the coronary calcium score. Now, a couple of words about familial hypercholesterolemia. This is an autosomal dominant disorder due to mutations either in the LDL receptor, where there are too few receptors that are produced genetically, an abnormality in the ApoB lipoprotein, or in the PCSK9. It'll make more sense in a minute. The heterozygote form of the patients we see as primary care folks, because these people come to us prematurely with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, women predominantly less than 50, men predominantly less than 30. And um, it's underdiagnosed. Um, we believe now about 1 in 200,000 have this disease. If you look at all these inherited disorders, you can see that familial hypercholesterolemia on the far left is four times more common than sickle cell disease and five times more common than cystic fibrosis. Yet, this isn't really on our radar. And it can be recognized by history and by the height of the LDL abnormality and by the physical exam. So here's a 64-year-old woman with recurrent atherosclerotic events, 58 years old, um, excuse me, she's 64, not 58, with a history of recurrent atherosclerotic events. She's currently on a Torva 80, a Zetamib 10, has an LDL of 92. While on this therapy, she suffered another non-STEMI. Her husband, a cardiologist, wonders if additional LDL lowering might reduce her risk. So her LDL is 92 on high-intensity statin azetamibe. This means untreated, her LDL likely began at greater than 200. When the LDL is over 190, we think about familial heterozygote hypercholesterolemia. So she certainly probably has this. Now, to diagnose that, you can look for or ask her if she's ever had tenderness anthomata. You can ask about her family history, mom and dad, brothers and sisters. In Europe, they'll pay for a genetic analysis. They will not pay for it here. It's a clinical diagnosis. If you can get the old chart and look at how high her LDL was before she was on a Torva 80 and a Zetamib 10, it can be very, very helpful. But how do you treat this? You use high-intensity statin. You then consider adding a Zetamib. You then consider adding a PCSK9 inhibitor and that's going to take pre-authorization and petitioning of the drug companies because this is a patient with familial heterozygote hypercholesterolemia who's already had recurrent events. So hopefully she's been in an insurance plan for more than a couple of years and she's not moving to another insurance plan and either through the help of a lipidologist or your own persistence, especially if the outcome trials become positive and we'll know that in about th four months. I think it's going to be easier to get this class of drug. But this is the algorithm that we're going to use. Statin, azetamibe, PCSK9 inhibitor. <clears throat> if you can't get the PCSK9 inhibitor, you can use a bile resin inhibitor and an absorption inhibitor together. And I already talked about LDL apheresis, and it is approved and it is paid for by insurance. The LDL greater than 200 with coronary disease, greater than 300 without. Okay, so what is PCSK9? This is a new class of drug, and it stands for proprotein convertase subtilesin kexin 9. So there's a 1 through 9. This is the ninth type of serine protease that has been discovered. This is a chaperone protein produced in the liver, put into the extrahepatic intravascular space, that basically is there just to facilitate another process. And this particular chaperone latches on to the apolipoprotein B LDL receptor complex and brings it into the liver for degradation. Now, why does it exist? Well, the, um, the People that have looked at this have thought that back in the day, this was probably produced 
to enable us nutritionally to have more cholesterol as a nutritional source. Because in genetic groups that have gain of functions of PCSK9, they have higher LDLs because the LDL receptor is chewed up in the liver. It'll make more sense in the, in the minute. And if you have a loss of function genetically, where you don't produce the gene to produce PCSK9, your LDLs are lower and you have less atherosclerotic disease. So if you were nutritionally deficient and you needed cholesterol as a source of nutrition, you would somehow develop a system where your cholesterol would be higher, your LDL would be higher, and you could use it more for all the things we use cholesterol for, as well as nutrition. So PCSK9 is secreted in the liver. This is blue to the far left. It comes into the intravascular space. It binds to the apolipoprotein LDL receptor complex. It brings it back into the liver where it is degraded in the lysozyme. And it then, PCSK9, goes back out and looks for more LDL cholesterol. If you block PCSK9 with a subcutaneous monoclonal antibody, the LDL receptor now is not degraded and its life cycle of 150 cycles continues to scavenge for LDL cholesterol to bring it into the liver to be degraded. So if you take a monoclonal antibody to block the PCSK9 receptor, you will have lower LDL cholesterol and the hopes of having less atherosclerotic disease. And that's exactly what happens when you take um, a, a monoclonal antibody shown in yellow here to the PCSK9, this point it doesn't work, where you now allow LDL to be recycled on the far right of the slide. And it's not degraded. So there are currently two on the market and a third that no longer will be looked at in further research, bosasudbamab. Now this is a humanized, notice that it has um, a Z, okay? It's, it's bosasuzumab, so it's a humanized monoclonal. Both alirocumab and, and, and evolocumab are fully human. And what happened with bosasuzumab by Pfizer is that over time, the LDL reduction was reduced. So we think, hasn't been released yet, that people developed antibodies to the protein. Not with a fully humanized antibody, it looks like both evolocumab and alirocumab have long lives of benefit with no antibody, neutralizing antibody, to this foreign protein, the monoclonal antibody. So PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies have been looked at by themselves on top of statins, by themselves in statin intolerant, with azetamibe, without azetamibe, with statin and azetamibe, without statin or azetamibe, and in, in genetic familial hyperlipidemias. And here's the interesting fact. It doesn't matter what you give this class of drug with, LDL is always reduced the same amount. It doesn't matter how much the LDL receptor is increased by the statin or the bile acid resin or the absorption inhibitor, the monoclonal antibody always seems to reduce LDL in addition to what you get from the statin or the bile acid or the absorption inhibitor, 50 to 60 percent. And when you look at the safety studies with here evolocumab and here with alirocumab, there's a 60% reduction in LDL, and these drugs seem to be safe. They've been followed now. We're going to have an outcome trial first quarter of 2017 with evolocumab, and um, they look to be very safe. So these drugs result in LDL cholesterol reductions 55 to 60%, triglyceride reduction and LP little a reductions of 30%. Doesn't matter what you give them with or in what setting. The question is going to be who's going to pay for them. There appear to be no dose-limiting toxicities, injection site reactions in 1 out of 20, 
And we've followed these drugs now for one and a half to two years in over 10,000 patients, and they seem to be safe. But we don't have outcomes, and that's what we're waiting on. So there are little differences between the two drugs, and this table that I put together summarizes them. Their shelf life, their refrigerator life, little differences. Evolocumab is, is approved in homozygote hypercholesterolemia, um, alirocumab only in heterozygote, and both in ASCVD. The question is going to be who's going to pay for them. Forget about bosuzumab. Fourier is coming out this next quarter. Very exciting. Odyssey outcomes, 2018, 2019. But the, the insurance companies are going to be forced to make decisions on these drugs when and if they show a benefit in clinical outcome, with or without statins, regardless of the background of therapy. So here are the outcome studies. Forget about Spire, because bosuzumab for fertility has been stopped. The other two are ongoing. The Data Monitoring Safety Board has not stopped the studies. Everyone's very encouraged. Here's the bottom line, the cost effectiveness. Who's going to pay for these drugs? I know that when these drugs are generic in 10 or 15 years, who's not going to take a subcutaneous in, uh, um, injection every month or every six months, because the newer ones are going to be longer duration of action, if the drug is really inexpensive and if the outcomes are improved. But the problem is that at 14,000 plus per year for these drugs, people don't want to pay for them. And this cost-effective analysis suggests that assuming 2015 prices, PCSK9 inhibitor use did not meet generally accepted cost-effectiveness thresholds and was not estimated to increase U.S. health care costs substantially. So, excuse me, and, and was estimated to increase the U.S. health care costs. So the payers are not wanting to pay for a class of drug they think is overpriced. But we'll see what the science and the clinical evidence suggests in a couple of months. So we talked about the guidelines. Uh, the guidelines de-emphasize LDL targets or thresholds. They're really more about risk. They're now recommending potency of the statin. There's controversy about them, but there's some discretion for physicians to discern if LDL reduction is adequate. If not, or the patient is statin intolerant or only tolerates a low dose of a statin, adjunctive additive therapies can be used. These include bile absorption inhibitors, bile resins. The, the PCSK9 inhibitors are exciting. They seem to do everything correctly for all the lipid subfractions. They lower LDL 55 to 60 percent regardless of what the background of therapy is, but payment for these drugs continue to be an important issue.